Welcome to the Stutzman channel. Now in this video you can see that the title is Micron Gauge versus a Vacuum Gauge Part 1. So this is going to be a two-part video series. Now the title is a little bit misleading but I wanted to take these two videos and, and put them together because I think both, both of them are very important. And so in this video I'm not going to be looking at a Micron Gauge versus a Vacuum Gauge per se. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to do a test in the second video. Now, I could have just done that video, but then there'll be a lot of terminology you would not understand. A lot of folks I know just, uh, don't understand about pressure and vacuum, the units that send the pressure. Then you have the conversions between them, and then you have the different units of pressure, you know, since, uh, such as inches of mercury, millimeters of mercury, tor readings, ball readings, pascals, and you know, so forth. So I thought what I would do in this video is I'm going to go in step by step in detail and we're gonna break all of that stuff down. Uh, a lot of people you're looking at gauges and you don't really understand what are you looking at. Even a lot of people in refrigeration don't understand them. So I want you to have a good understanding of all this stuff. So like I said, we're gonna break it all down. And once you, under, once you go through this video, I know it's going to be a little bit long, but once you go through this video, I guarantee you'll understand everything there is to know about pressures and, you know, all the other stuff we talked about. Now, I, was, I watched a lot of videos on YouTube, you know, about uh, mini splits. And this is where this is going to kind of be associated with the three videos that I did on the mini split. First one doing a line set installation showing how to bend the tubing and then we did a pressure check with uh, the nitrogen and then finally we did a evacuation of the unit with a micron gauge and that's and so I see a lot of DIY guys they're out there doing the evacuation and they're using their manifold gauge set. Now even in the even in the installation manual it'll tell you about hooking your gauges up and you know, not, you're not, no, no mention of a pressure test. Now I got a lot of questions on those three videos. Uh, some of the questions was, uh, do I need to use a micron gauge? And that's what we're going to find out in the second video. And then also there was questions about, do I need to do a pressure test? And I'm going to answer all these questions in the second video. And then finally, there's other questions about the valve coil removal tools that I was using. And also, why did I use two instead of just one? So, with all of that being said, let's get started and get onto this here video and let's get all this stuff of terminology and pressures and vacuums and let's break it down and let's see if we can understand what this is all about. Okay, so let's get started with our first thing we're going to talk about is pressure. Now, if I took a, if I took a dish Let's say a glass dish, okay? And let's make our mercury, let's say, red. And we're going to fill it up with mercury. There's our mercury in there, okay? And now let's say that I took a glass tube. Now a glass tube is going to be filled up all the way to the top with mercury. Now on one end of this glass tube, it's going to be closed off. The other end is open. I fill it all the way up with mercury. And I don't recommend anybody doing this because mercury is very poisonous, it's toxic, so it's something you gotta be very, very careful if you're doing any kind of experiments with. And of course, you got gloves on and everything. And so anyway, this here, we've filled this mercury all the way up inside the tube to the very top, and then we put a finger, we flip it over, and now while we have our finger over it, then what we're gonna do is we're going to immerse it down into this here glass of mercury. Okay? Now what is going to happen is that the mercury that's inside the column tube here is going to drop. And when it drops, then that's going to give us a measurement that we can measure from the top of this mercury in the dish to where it falls up up here. And by the way, this little space up here that's going to be created is going to be a vacuum up here. Now if we was to measure this here height, we're going to find out that that is going to be 29.92 inches of mercury. Okay. 
And that's going to be at sea level, and that's the standard that's used at sea level, 29.92 inches of mercury. And HG is used because that's the chemical symbol uh, you know, for mercury. Now while we're talking about mercury, I had a very interesting encounter with mercury when I was in high school. Now I'll save that story in the second video near the end, and I think you'll find it very interesting. Now this experiment right here was done by a fella named Torricelli. Now Torricelli, he was a he was a Italian physicist and mathematician, and he did this experiment in 1643. And so he is giving credit for inventing the first mercury barometer, and the barometer is a device that's used to measure atmospheric pressure. And what is happening is the atmospheric pressure is coming down, pushing on the liquid, the metal, the mercury that's in the dish, and then it's pushing it up inside the tube, where then we can make an a measurement. Now, this here also equates to, at sea level, a 14.7 PSI A. Okay, so let me put over here off to the side that it's also equal to 14.7 PSI A. Now that's absolute. That's absolute pressure. Now since we're talking about absolute pressure, let's take a look at this here. Illustration of a gauge which is measuring pounds per square inch absolute. You'll notice that the port is not hooked up to any equipment, so it is actually looking at atmospheric pressure. So if we look at our pointer, we can see that it is measuring 14.7 PSIA, which is the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level. Now let's say that we hooked this gauge up and we hooked it up to a piece of equipment and we're going to start to pull a vacuum on it. Now as we are pulling the vacuum, the needle is going to drop. As the needle drops, it's going to go to 10, it's going to go to 5, and then finally we're going to hit 0 if we could pull a perfect vacuum, which is not possible here on Earth. Now that brings up another point. All gauges, whether they're absolute or if they're measuring gauge pressure, and we'll talk about gauge pressure a little later in the video, all these gauge pressures and absolute pressures are going to be measured in reference to another pressure. In this case, absolute pressure gauges are measured in reference to a perfect vacuum, which is zero PSIA. And if you notice, zero is the lowest number, so you cannot go any lower. When you hit zero, you've got a perfect vacuum. So you're not going to see any negative numbers on a gauge that's measuring absolute pressure. You might be wondering, and, if, and by the way, as we're, as we're coming up with this, let's put all these here, things that we know down so that we can do some conversions later between these units of pressure. So this is also going to be one atmosphere of pressure. Now we also know that one atmosphere of pressure is also going to be our 29.92 inches of mercury. And it's also going to be equal to our 14.7 PSI absolute pressure. Now this here 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute, that is, that is uh, not only just pushing down, but it's also pushing in all directions. It's all around us, the air is all around us. So this right here is uh, pressing down on everything, objects, tables, chairs, and so, and it's, and it's pushing in all different directions, as I said. So inside you, you don't feel it because inside this here pressure is pushing out also. So you have an equalization of pressure. You start to subtract out the two, so the net force is zero. So you don't feel it. So let's talk about this 14.7 PSI of pressure here. Let's start off with a diagram of our Earth. So here's Earth. 
Now hopefully most of you believe the earth is round and not flat, okay? All right, so now we have, we have an atmosphere that's around the earth. Now the atmosphere is broken up into z different zones. So the first one, if we start from the ground and we go out we, about seven miles, we have a stratosphere, a troposphere. Now the troposphere, we go out a little bit further, out to about 30 miles. Then we have our stratosphere. And we continue out, we got a mesosphere. Then if we go out, then we have a ionosphere. And it goes on out to several hundred miles. Now as the air goes on up higher and higher and higher, you know, it gets less dense and it doesn't weigh as much. Now, you know, I've asked some people, I says, you know, what is this 14.7 PSI? What does that mean? You know, a lot of people didn't even know what that meant. So I'm trying to do this here to show, kind of illustrate what this means. If I could take a tube, let's say a tube of one inch square inside diameter, and let's say this tube, and I could zero it out here on, the, on Earth, and I'm down here with my scale, and I took a tubing and it went all the way out, one inch internal inside diameter, and let's say I could cap this off, and then I got, I captured this air, and I zeroed out the tubing, and when I weighed it, that air all the way up would weigh 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level, okay? So that's what that means. One cubic inch of air all the way up, 14.7 PSI. Now, now that we're talking about this here elevation, you know, as we higher we goes up, then you know that the air pressure is going to be less. So if we're up on a mountain, let's say we're up on a mountain, and this mountain is 10,000 feet high. Now for every 1,000 feet that you go up in elevation, then the mercury over here would obviously drop because we don't have as much air pressure. So what you're going to find is that for every 1,000 feet that you go up, that your mercury of inches is going to drop by one inch. So to drop one inch of mercury. So if we took this apparatus and we're up here on top of the mountain here, and then we're going to do our measurement again, and then we can see with 10,000 feet of elevation, we're going to be dropping 10 inches of mercury. So if, we had, if we're at sea level when we start this and we go up to this mountain, and then we go up, then we're going to lose 10 inches of mercury, and then we're going to find out that we got 19.92 inches of mercury mercury at this elevation. Okay? Now, now that we're talking about elevation and going up, let's say, let's say that we are now, we're going to take this here apparatus that we got, and let's say that we're going to put him inside a bell jar. So here's our bell jar. And let's say he's sitting on some rubber platform. And then over here, well, let's put him over here. Let's say over here we got a port, and then we're going to hook it up to a vacuum pump. So there's a vacuum pump. And now we're going to now we're going to start now we're going to start taking the air out of this here system. Now as we take the air out, then there's going to be less atmospheric pressure. Therefore, it's not going to be pushing down on the, on the mercury that's in the dish. And that means that this here mercury is going to start to drop, just as it was when we were on top of the mountain. Now if we could, th if we could remove every single bit of air that's inside this here jar, then we're going to see that we're going to have zero inches of mercury. So in other words, we're going to come all the way down to here, and then it's going to be right in line with our level of mercury that's in the dish. And if we measure that, of course, it's going to be zero. Now, 
Now, theoretically, you cannot reach a perfect vacuum. In fact, even in space, it's not a perfect vacuum because there's always a few hydrogen molecules, say, in a one cubic foot of space out there. So even in space, it's not a perfect vacuum. And you cannot achieve a perfect vacuum here on Earth. We try to get as close as we can. That's objective. But this is theoretically, this is what it would be if we could remove all the air that's inside that jaw. And by the way, since we're talking about this here vacuum, this would also equate to, as I mentioned, this is zero, zero inches of mercury when it's under a vacuum, okay, vacuum. That would also equate to zero PSI absolute. So in other words, there is no air. There's zero pressure. Okay, so now we understand about inches of mercury. Now there's going to be other units of measurement that you're going to run across is called millimeters of mercury. The only difference is this is just uh, using a metric measurement, which is going to equate to this 29.92 inches of mercury. So let's try to do an example here. Let's say we're going to start off with 29.92 inches of mercury, and we want to know what is that equal to in millimeters of mercury. Well, we start off with what we're given, and this is 29, this is 29.92 inches of mercury. Now we need a conversion factor here. Now we want to go into millimeters. Now we know that millimeters is part of a meter, so let's look at that. If we come down here, and if I draw a measurement, a stick, this is going to be our meter. Now a meter is 39.37 inches long. And we also know that in a meter, there are all 1,000 millimeters in it. So in other words, milli is 1,000th. So that means we're going to have 1,000 millimeters. So let's make that up here. Let's put that up here. Let's put, say, 1,000 millimeters. So we have that. Okay. And that's all we need. Now we're going to go back to uh, what we were given. We're going to multiply this unit and we're going to multiply it by these two 1,000 millimeters and 39.37. Now I need my units either inches or mercury to cancel out in the denominator. That's the number that's on the bottom. So if I look over here, I see I have inches. So I'm going to put 39.37 inches on the bottom. Now you can see that my inch units will cancel out. So there we'll go. That will go. 39.37 inches is also, we said, is equal to 1,000 millimeters. So I'm going to put M up here on the top. So these two are equal to each other. Now if I multiply these two numbers on the top, divided by this number right here, then I should be able to get 759.97 millimeters of mercury. Now you'll see this number is going to be rounded off up to uh, 760 millimeters of mercury. So that is one number that you will see. Now, this 760 millimeters equates to another gauge. And this gauge is a suppressor unit and it's the tor. So let's say I had a tor gauge. Okay. It's open to the atmospheric pressure. And in this case, and this, and this gauge is a tor, so let's put uh, tor right here. It's a tor gauge. And, it, and you're going to see that it'll start off over here at 760. And of course, that is measured in millimeters of mercury. And then you'll see the numbers will go on down, 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 down. And then you'll see it'll go to zero.
So at atmospheric pressure, sea level, we're going to be measuring that 760 millimeters of mercury. Now let's say that we have this gauge and it's hooked up to a, 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 a some equipment, say uh, looking at vacuum. Now we had several of these gauges on some equipment that we had on some uh, that we were looking at far as in a vacuum. It had to stay under a vacuum. And so when you pull a vacuum on the tour gauge, then what's going to happen is, is your needle is going to come all, start decreasing, 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 and decreasing. And then you're going to see that it's going to get down to zero. And again, zero is a perfect vacuum. So, but again, we can't reach that, so we should, we'll get down close. So there's our perfect vacuum, if we could get down to it, and it would measure zero. Now, the other thing about absolute pressure that you're measuring on a gauge, a gauge, is, when you're looking at a gauge and it's measuring pressure, whether it's absolute or gauge pressure, and we haven't talked about that yet, you're going to be measuring relative to some other pressure. Here with absolute pressure, we're going to be measuring relative to a perfect vacuum. So you're not going to see a, an absolute gauge having negative pressures. In other words, zero is low as you can go. That is the lowest number. So you're not going to have negative pressures on an absolute uh, pressure gauge. Okay, so zero is the lowest you can go. Here's an example of a commercial tool gauge. It has two scales. Now the scale that's on the inside, you can see there's 760. It's measuring atmospheric pressure. If we were to put a vacuum on this here, then you would see that the pointer would go counterclockwise towards zero. And if we're at zero, we would have a perfect vacuum. This here is in millimeters of mercury. On the outer scale, we have inches of mercury. So at atmospheric pressure, we have zero inches of mercury. And as the vacuum is being pulled on the system, then we will be increasing in our inches of mercury. So if we get down to 29.92 inches of mercury at sea level, theoretically, we would have a perfect vacuum. Now, another thing that you might see far is in millimeters of mercury, is when you go to the doctor. When you go get your blood pressure taken, you're going to get two numbers. You're going to get your top number, systolic reading, then you're going to get your bottom number, your diastolic reading. But what are these two numbers representing? How are they being represented? Well, believe it or not, it's in millimeters of mercury. So for example, I went to the doctor a couple of days ago to get a checkup. So my blood pressure was 117 over 77. But what does that mean? Well, it means that it is millimeters of mercury. You can see that with all of this right here, we're taking the height of mercury and we're relating that pressure to the distance that the mercury is up. And in fact, in the old days, this, the sphygmomanometer, which is a device to measure your blood pressure, was used, and they, they actually used mercury. And it was a column, just kind of like what we're talking here with the mercury barometer. And then there was a scale right down on the side. And then when they pump, you know, put the cuff on you and they you know, pump the pressure, close off your artery and all, and then what happened is they, the, the, the mercury would rise up and then they look at the height and then they compare it to the scale to see where it was at. And so this here top number is where they're looking at when your heart is actually beating because you got it restricted. And then they see how high the pressure is by looking at the level. And then when, you, when they let it off, then they listen to where the heart is not beating. So it's at a rest and then you get your bottom number. So, but nowadays they don't use mercury. You don't have mercury in pretty much anything because they kind of banned it and everything. So now they have all these electronic devices to measure your blood pressure. But the next time you go to a doctor and they have it on you, look at the readings and you'll see that these two numbers is gonna be represented in millimeters of mercury.
Here's an example of a sphygmomanometer. She used to measure blood pressure. Now the liquid that's inside the tube is not mercury because now it's been banned. So they're using a different type of fluid in here to simulate mercury. But again, you can see the scale that's on the side, which will be representing in millimeters of mercury to measure your blood pressure. Now the next thing, another unit that you are here is microns. Microns, like you'll have a micron gauge. What, what, is this, what is this microns? What is that all about? Okay, well, let's go back to our meter that we had earlier. A micron is one millionth of a meter. That's the distance of how much a, a micron is. So that means there are one million microns in a meter. So let's go ahead and we'll make a notation of that. So now we've got one million microns. And that's what a meter is. Okay? Now, before we go too far, let's go ahead and we'll write down what this here, we got our 760 millimeters of mercury is. Okay? And now we're working on our microns. Now, so we need a conversion. We want to start off with our 29.92 inches of mercury, and now we want to know what, how many microns is that going to be. All right? So we start off with what we're given. We have 29.92 inches of mercury. And so we're looking at this right here, and we got inches of mercury. So I need, I need at least, say, maybe inches in the bottom. So we notice 39.37 inches in a meter. We can see that our inch units will cancel out. And we can see that on the top, what we want is what is going to be equivalent in microns to this. Well, we already said it is one million microns. So we're going to put him right up here. Now if we multiply this out and divide it, then we should be able to get a number of 759,969.51 microns of mercury. But you're going to see that rounded off also, so the number that you're going to see for that one is going to be 760,000. And instead of writing microns out, a lot of times they will use the Greek letter mu to represent microns, just as they do in micro. So we'll put a mu symbol there, and then we'll put Hg for mercury. And so that's another one that we're going to have. So let's go ahead and we'll write that one down. So we have now 760,000 microns of mercury. Now with the micron gauge that we're going to be measuring, of course, is microns of mercury. Now again, this is absolute pressure. We're actually measuring what the pressure is. So if we had a micron gauge, let's say we had a micron gauge, and now all of them now, you know, electronic. They got an LCD on them. And let's say we just open to the atmospheric pressure. You already know what it should be measuring, right? It's going to be, it'd be measuring close to 760,000 microns of mercury. And that's at atmospheric pressure. Again, this is at sea level. So if you're up a little higher, a little lower, then you know that, that value right here is going to vary. Now, uh, on all of these here micron gauges, you're not going to see it actually read this pressure because it's designed to read vacuum pressure. All right? So, with this here, if you look at it, like say we did with the, now this is just say if we had a, uh, 
an analog micron gauge, which you're not going to see. And let's say we started off right here, 760,000, and then we had this as micron of mercury, microns of mercury. Then our gauge would be right here, like it was for the Tor gauge, which was at 760. Oh, and by the way, the Tor, T-O-R-R, -R, that gauge, that unit of pressure, is in honor of T-O-R-R, Torricelli. So it was named after him. So getting back to our micron gauge, if we could pump down all the way down to zero, which would, then that would be our perfect vacuum. So it's going to be just like the Tor, tor gauge, and it go down to zero, if we could get a perfect vacuum. And that's right here. But you know, you're not going to reach that though, as we already said. So on most of these here micron gauges, you're not going to see it reading this actual atmospheric pressure. Now the one that I have, it will start out, and what it would read after it boots up and calibrates, it will say high, it will say high P, high pressure. Just meaning it's measuring atmospheric pressure, but it's not actually giving you that number. Now, once you start pulling the vacuum on the system, then it is, the numbers, you know, is going to get down to a point where the numbers will actually come in. So then you will start at 25,000, right? So when you hit 25,000 microns on your, on your unit, then you will see the numbers will pop up. Some of the other micron gauges that's out there, when they're reading high pressure, they, you know, again, they won't show you that actual value, but what they would do is they would just kind of maybe put some dashes across there. And then once you hit the uh, limit, depending on the manufacturer of what they want the numbers to show up, then you'll start to see the numbers. And here's an example of a micron gauge. Now in all cases, in all cases, when you're using a mic micron gauge, EPA uh, section 609 says that you have to be down to at least 500 microns. So think about that. We're starting at 760,000 microns, and we're going to go from that number, pulling the air out, and we're going to go all the way down to 500 microns. And that's, that's pretty low number. Now, if you can go lower, that's great because you're getting even more out of it. But they want you to hit at least 500, all right? So now we're thinking, well, what is this here 500 microns? You might be wondering, 500 microns. Now, all of this stuff we can convert and go back and forth. So we got microns, we got inches of mercury, we got millimeters of mercury, we got all this. So if we were at 500 microns, like this here, over here, let's go back to this here jaw. If we come all the way down and we hit 500 microns in here, let's say we had a micron gauge hooked up there, how high would the mercury inside the tube be above the level of mercury that's inside the dish? So what we do is, we, again, we start with what we're given. We're given 500 microns. So we come up to here, we're gonna write 500 microns. We're going to multiply. We need our conversion factor here. Now you see I have microns in my units over here. So in my denominator, I need microns to cancel that unit out, those two units. So we look, what do we got? Well, we need microns. We look right here, we got 760,000. So let's put that one down there. So there's our 760,000 microns. But now we need to equate that to, we want inches of mercury, because we remember we wanted to know how high is this mercury going to be in the tube above the level of this. So now we're going to write down 29.92. 29.92 inches of mercury. Now you can see that the microns are going to cancel out. 
We multiply this out, divide it, and what we're going to be left with, 0 0.0197 inches of mercury. That's, that means that is about 20 thousandths of an inch. That's how high that this mercury in the tube will be above the top of this here liquid. Okay? Now, let's look at... Some of you thinking now, okay, well, you know what would be good is, well, if I get down to 500 microns, what kind of air pressure am I looking at inside that system that I'm evacuating? We, again, we start off with what we're given. So we have 500 microns. We need our conversion factor. We need microns in the bottom. There you go. 760,000 microns. Okay. Now what do we have on the top? Well, at 760,000 microns of mercury, what is our air pressure? There it is. 14.7 PSIA. So we're going to write that right up here. Notice our microns cancels out, giving us units of PSIA, which is exactly what we want. Now, if we take these two numbers here on the top, we multiply them out, divide it by the number on the bottom, and we're going to see that we're going to have a pressure of 0 0.0097 PSIA. Now, you can see... Now, we started out at 14.7 PSIA of pressure. And then when we got down to 500 microns, this is the pressure that you're going to have inside your system, which is very, very low. And so that's a minimum. So you want to get down to at least 500. You go down below 500, that's even better. Now, one other, other couple of other pressures that we ought to talk about, just so we, just so we mention them. But you're not going to run into it in refrigeration, but they are out there, and that's a bar and a pascal. So let's say that for completing our thing here, we're going to say a bar, right? So one bar is the same thing as all of this right here. So one bar is basically one atmosphere of pressure. Okay? Now pascal is a unit of a metric SI unit. You're not going to really run into that in refrigeration and we're just only going to bring it up just so that you know it's out there. Now since a pascal is a very small unit of measurement then we're going to we're going to equate this into something like pounds per square inch where we can kind of maybe understand it a little better. Well one pascal is equal to 0 0.000145 PSI absolute. So that is a very small measurement. So one pascal is. Now to equate this here pascal to what we've already been talking about, such as our 14.7 PSIA and our 29.92 inches of mercury and all of this right here, then we can say that all of this is going to be equal to 101,320 pascals. Now let's talk about gauge pressure. We've already covered absolute pressure. Remember, absolute pressure is measuring relative to a perfect vacuum, which is going to be zero PSIA. Now gauge pressure Let's start off with a gauge. There's our gauge. And here's and this is an analog gauge. And let's say we had 300 PSI. So there's 300 and here's our PSIG. Now sometimes you will see a gauge that'll have a G on the end and sometimes you won't. But if you see PSI, then you know that you're measuring gauge pressure, okay? 
And let's say that we're going on down. Our numbers are incrementing, incrementing, and it's going on down. And again, we go to zero. Okay. Let me back up right up in here. Let's put me a few more numbers. Let's say there's 10, there's 20, 30. Okay. Now, this here gauge, like the others, are open to atmospheric pressure. Okay. We don't have it hooked up to no equipment. It's just open. We're looking at it. What you're going to see in this gauge, unlike the absolute gauge, which read that 14.7 PSIA, this gauge is going to be sitting right on zero. So there, it's actually, there's atmospheric pressure on the gauge, but yet the gauge is reading zero. This is gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is measured relative to atmospheric pressure. In doing that, then we're going to have zero as our reference. If we were to look at, say, and, and equating and looking at absolute and gauge pressure. Let's say, let's say that if this is gauge pressure, then to know what absolute pressure is, all I have to do is take and add 14.7 PSI to this. Now I've got absolute pressure. And if I had a gauge, say, that was absolute pressure, and this is going to be PSIA, and let's say that it's reading, oh, I don't know, let's say 50 PSIA. And if I wanted to know what the gauge pressure is, then I would just take and subtract 14.7, and then that will give me my gauge pressure. Now, on all of these here gauges that's measuring gauge pressure, this is pretty much what you're going to find in everything that you're going to measure, right? Your gauges that's on your refrigeration manifold gauges, both the low and the high gauge, is measuring gauge pressure. If you was to go out there and say measure the tire pressure in your cars and you got your gauge there, you're going to measure it. Well, that's gauge pressure that it's looking at. If you get one of the electronic units, you turn it on, it comes up to zero. Well, zero, just like what we mentioned up here a little earlier, where it's pointing at zero, that's gauge pressure. So it's not actually showing you the atmospheric pressure. Hey, it's 14.7 PSI, A, and yet I don't have it hooked up to anything. And here's an example of a gauge that's measuring gauge pressure. As you can see, it's not hooked up to anything. It's uh, looking at atmospheric pressure. The pointer is sitting at zero, and it's exactly just what we illustrated. If you notice on the gauge, you can see right under 2000 that it has PSIG. And also, maybe this little chart, this little diagram right here might help out a little bit. If we go right into the center right here, if we're looking at, say, absolute pressure, we know that's going to be our 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute. But if we're looking on a gauge and having gauge pressure, we're going to see that we're going to have zero PSIG, which is also the same thing, that all of this is equal to one atmosphere. If I slide it to the right and go in, in positive pressure, and let's say that I'm looking at a gauge pressure of 75 PSIG. Well, my absolute pressure is where I would add in my 14.7 pounds per square inch, and then I get 89.7 PSI, and sorry about that, that should be an A. Okay. And on the other extreme, if I'm starting from here at atmospheric pressure, and I start pulling the air out, then I'm going to go all the way down to zero PSIA. So like I said, absolute pressure is measured reference to a perfect vacuum of zero PSIA. And another way to look at it, if we look back to our little line graph here, and if we're looking at like vacuum pressure, we start at our reference of say atmospheric pressure again is 14.7 PSIA. 
Now, if we're looking against, say, vacuum, we could say that's zero pounds per square inch of vacuum because we haven't, we now have a vacuum because we're at atmospheric pressure. And now we're going to define the atmospheric pressure in this case to be zero inches of mercury. Now, as we remove the air, we're going to be, if we get all the way down to a perfect vacuum, we'll be at zero PSI absolute, just like we mentioned before. And if we start at this here zero PSI V of vacuum, and if we remove the air, then you could think of that as, as the pressure is going to be decreasing. So if you get it all out, you could think of that as minus 14.7 PSI vacuum. But now if we also, we can look at it that if we started at zero and remove the air, then we're going to be incrementing in our inches of mercury, which is going to be 29.92 inches of mercury under a vacuum. Now that brings up another type of gauge, which is a compound gauge. Now the compound gauge, you're going to see that's on your refrigeration manifold gauge set, and that's going to be the gauge that's on the left, your low side gauge. Now there's going to be, let's look at it, there's our gauge, and we're going to have, oh, let's say it goes up to 350, PSI. Again, this is gauge pressure, as I mentioned earlier, and we're going to have a zero, and then we're going to have this area down in here be probably a different color, and then you'll see this here say inches of mercury vacuum. So anything that's above here is going to be positive pressure. Anything below zero is going to be your inches of mercury in a vacuum, or like your negative pressure. So what it is called a compound gauge because it is measuring, it can measure two different types of pressure. It can measure a positive pressure. One is that atmospheric pressure of zero, remember, relative anything above that's positive and it can measure anything below which is negative. And there's an example of a compound gauge that you'll see on your refrigeration gauge set. Now we'll talk a little bit more about this and we'll go over the real example in the garage in the second part of the video. Okay that's going to wrap this video up at least the first one here. The second one like I said is we're going to do the actual tests and we're going to see what the results are. And I hope you found this video interesting. Now you know everything I know about pressures and vacuums and all the different units of pressures and how they are converted. And so hopefully you might find some information here that might be helpful. At least now you're aware of what you're, when you're looking at a gauge, you understand that you got absolute pressure, you got gauge pressure, and now you know the difference. If you find the video helpful, be sure to subscribe and we'll try to get you some more useful information and feel, feel uh, so you can have some more knowledge there, carry on with you, making better decisions in the jobs that you do. You guys take care, and I'll see you in the next one.